Hi, I'm Femi OK, and you're in the stream. Why is the Chinese government separating Uyghur Muslim families? I'm Malika Bilal, and today we meet people who say they've been unable to contact detained relatives as China is accused of cracking down on Muslim communities. Have questions for our guests? Be sure to leave them in the YouTube chat and we will include them in our conversation. But first, here's Al Jazeera's Adrian Brown reporting from the capital of China's Xinjiang region. Tahir Amin believes he'd be in a camp if he returned to Xinjiang. He says a Chinese state security agent tried to persuade him to go back after he moved to Israel to study early last year, leaving his wife and daughter behind in Xinjiang. The agent, also a Uyghur, telephoned him repeatedly, wanting details of Amin's contacts in Israel. Sometimes the calls were taunting. Your daughter won't turn out to be a scum like you, says the voice. She'll be useful to the Communist Party. Before Imin left China, he lived here, Aramshi, the provincial capital of Xinjiang. He used to call his daughter all the time, but in February she told him, don't call me or my mother again. Her last words to her father were these, you're a bad person. There are credible reports, according to the United Nations, that a million or more Uyghur Muslims are being held in what amounts to internment camps in China, and now increasingly their families are speaking out. Many say their family members have been imprisoned indefinitely in facilities that the Chinese government refers to as vocational training centers, which it says are necessary for fighting separatism and what it calls religious extremism. A Chinese government official recently warned people to be wary of, quote, gossip or rumor, unquote, suggesting mistreatment of Xinjiang's ethnic minorities. But U.S. lawmakers recently proposed legislation urging the Trump administration to curb what they say is China's continued abuse and surveillance of Uyghurs. Here with us to talk about the alleged crackdown on the Uyghur community and the toll it's taken on many families, Korchela Hoja is a journalist for Radio Free Asia's Uyghur Service. That's a U.S.-funded news organization that was one of the first to expose the situation in Xinjiang. Nuri Takel is chairman of the Uyghur Human Rights Project in the U.S. state of North Carolina. Aydin Anwar is the media and press relations officer for the East Turkestan National Awakening Movement and in New York City, Akshaya Kumar is the Deputy United Nations Director for Human Rights Watch. We also reached out to a number of Chinese state officials, but we didn't get a response back. Hello, everybody. It's good to have you here. Gucheta, in China, you were a pretty impressive TV journalist. You had your own show. Um, it, it, was, it was a good time for you there. Can you tell us and set the scene what it was like when you were working there and why you had to leave? Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity to speak up for our nation, ourselves. Yes, I was a TV host in Xinjiang TV mm -hmm. uh, before come here, join RFA. Uh, I came to United States 2001 to work for Radio Free Asia. So I was uh, hosting a children program mm -hmm. uh, in Xinjiang TV. Uh, as you know, uh, Communist Party in China control every news organization, TV station, radio. So uh, whatever, how you success, you're still using as a propaganda tool. Uh -huh. So I deeply uh, feel that when I was uh, in certain level, uh -huh. so I know Chinese government, um, the policy toward the Uyghurs are like seems to um, occupy uh, the country more strongly, and then they want to use their policy to uh, brainwash the people mm -hmm. and uh, make more like. Uh, far from their history and uh, their identity. So then when I was uh, have a opportunity to uh, out from the China during the vacation time to Europe, mm -hmm. so I have chance to listen to the Radio Free Asia. And the, the uh, what can I say? I 
you deeply saw, you feel. You saw China in a, in a very different way once you were outside yes, and had yes. different access I, I to different sources. I feel this is the okay. true uh, press, you know. This is the true journalism. So I need to join this company. So I was directly called the RFA. So. I came to the United States. So you left your family behind, and it's yes. leaving your family behind that made you realize what has been happening more so and more personally to the Uyghur population there. What's happened to your family? So actually, Chinese uh, policy toward the Uyghurs is not suddenly happened. It's a systematic crackdown. Uh, so when uh, I start work in the RFA, uh, seems Chinese government was very angry and it put me in the red uh, hat uh, list, right? Red paper, black paper, black. yeah, leather. Yeah. So that, that's uh, like so a blacklist. Yes, blacklist. Chinese version then of a blacklist. My, uh, my family members uh, targeted as a criminal. You know, they visiting uh, my uh, parents' house uh, frequently to harass them. You know, then after uh, this. 2016, after Chen Chuanguo rules Xinjiang, uh, the situation uh, become more worse. First, I hear my brother taken to the re-education, they call re-education camp. Um, 2007, uh, 2017, how you September. Know, how did you know that happened to him? How did you know uh, where he went? That time, I, I could call my mom. I. I've been talking to my mom uh, on phone like one twice a month. Mm -hmm. We just talk very like little, just make sure they're okay. Mm -hmm. So when I was called 2017, uh, <coughs> September, my mom says my brother taken away. Uh -huh. um, so she was asking the Chinese officials, why are you taking my son? They uh, answer back, says, you're uh, her, his sister uh, over there, is that not enough to take him? Oh, so, so this, is, this was punishment? Yes, This was punishment I think for so. you leaving China. Mm -hmm. Okay, this, this is not an unusual story. Yep. Malika? It's unfortunately not, based on what we're hearing from people online. Uh, Gosheder, of course, you're not alone there. This is a tweet we got um, from someone whose handle is just Uyghur ATA. Uh, he writes, they have not, meaning China and the Communist Party, admitted to the very existence of the camps in the first place. And then when they did, the Communist Party changed their tone and said, yes, we have vocational training centers. Who is the liar then, he writes. They detain Uyghurs from all walks of life, academics, sportsmen, actors, scholars, etc. Ak Akshaya, what what do we know about the camps? It's uh, actual facts. What, what facts do you have about what's going on there? Well, we at Human Rights Watch have written an in-depth report about the camps, but also about the broader campaign of repression against Turkic Muslims, especially Uyghurs in Xinjiang. And one thing um, that the person who tweeted made a really great point is that we faced a lot of denial from the Chinese government, and so we have to present facts. We've brought forward satellite images, we've dug through government procurement contracts to really just put together a paper trail that shows that we can really believe that almost a million people are being kept in camps without any process, often without even being charged for a crime, just on a suspicion. Uh, maybe they talked too much about one of the suspicious countries that China has identified. They have a list of 26. Maybe they prayed five times a day. Uh, maybe they did something else to arouse suspicion. And then they were forced into living in a camp uh, and being put through political re-education exercises, but also, in some cases, torture and mistreatment. It's deeply concerning. Nuri. Let's, uh, let's talk about what kind of government that we're dealing with. The Chinese government is, is famous and well known for conflating the facts and confusing the general public in addition to denying a obvious fact. Um, even if they did not, let's say, if they didn't uh, lock up more than 10% of the population, what they have done with a specific mindset, engaging in human engineering, in of itself is a crime against humanity. Human engineering. Yes. Explain more. Human engineering is taking place on multiple fronts. They're fo forcing Uyghurs to give up their centuries-old ethno-national tradition, language, way of life, values, and religion 
and trying to convert them into something that they have never been or, or something that they're not belonging to. So what the Chinese government has been doing in the last 20 months is, is something what we call in the United States a conversion therapy. Uh, and in, in theory, it's a, it's a human engineering, and they have also used a technological means and ways to uh, uh, monitor who are not being managed to get in the camps. The society has been turned into a, a totalitarian, totalitarian a police state. Mm -hmm. And that if you're not careful, I mean, we have to highlight this very important fact. Some countries, uh, we just read yesterday, a uh, day before yesterday on, on the papers, that Venezuelan government is borrowing the technological advantages from the Chinese to issue new types of ID cards. Sudan, Pakistan, and several other countries already looking to China as a model to monitor their own citizens. So this, this, is, this should like not be constrained into the Uyghur concern. Mm -hmm. This should be a concern for the world, the civilized people around the world. As you were talking there, I, I, I could see you nodding your head there, but I, I want to I bring this in and I want to give it to you. This is a World um, Uyghur Congress who writes in, keeping in mind what Noray just said, uh, they say nearly every member of the Uyghur diaspora has a family member arbitrarily detained in the camps and has lost contact for more than a year. It's these people who've gone out of their way not to put loved ones at risk, but the Chinese government has indiscriminately locked them up anyway. So. Thinking of that story, this is just one of so many we've heard. We got a video comment from someone who says something very similar. This is Alfred, who's a student here in the U.S., and this is what he told the stream. Three years ago, I came to the United States as an international student. Yet, shortly after I came, Chinese government started its crackdown on all Uyghurs and Kazakhs in my occupied homeland. Thus, I lost all contact with my family since then. And just recently, from a Kazakh family friend of mine who fled to Kazakhstan, I have learned that my father sentenced to nine year prison and my mom detained to concentration camp last year. And I have, um, I have at least 11 of my relatives either in concentration camp or in jail right now. International community must stand up for this 21st century concentration camps and brutal ethnic cleansing in Uzbekistan and in Tibet. So Aiden, he says 21st century concentration camps. I know that you have relatives, hundreds of them actually, who have gone missing as well. Yes. So I have, um, from both my mom and dad's side, combined over 200 relatives who have disappeared and we, who we have had no contact with. Um, and there's no way of contacting them um, and figuring out if they're alive or dead. And um, you know, Alfred mentioned the word ethnic cleansing, and that's something that's usually a term that a lot of people shy away from, um, saying that, oh, like, you know, ethnic cleansing comprises of certain things that we sh and we shouldn't, like, make that big claim. But what people need to realize is that these camps are not just, you know, an attack on cultural identity or the policies that China is employing on the Uyghurs is not just is not just a way to attack our culture and our language and like our centuries old traditions, but it's also a way to physically exterminate our people. And I think that's usually what's left out of this context is the fact that you know, we're actually in occupied territory. Our territory is named East Turkestan, and China has renamed that as Xinjiang, which means new territory. Um, and so we've been, you know, we've lived with centuries of independence um, before, and, you know, it wasn't the, until 1912 that we had the first official Chinese invasion. And after that, we had uh, two East Turkestan Islamic republics that were established shortly after, which were um, crushed by the Chinese forces. And in 1949, Communist China came to power, and um, since then we've been living under the occupation. And usually it's not framed as an occupation. And so this, with the existence of the camps, um, you know, the camps aren't like a new, uh, sorry, like the oppression has been going on for, you know, decades now. The camps mm -hmm. are just a new, um, a new tactic that China is using to basically lock up our entire population I think, and, and I, I, slowly, I think because um, we're talking about yeah. it I think what's really difficult is for us to picture something that we can't right. see that right. that we're pretty confident are there but we don't right. know where and there's so many right. reasons why people end up there and then so many rumors as well I, I know right. that there's a, some uh, an uncle's brother of yours and a horrific story are you right. are you convinced that that story is true tell us that story please I mean, these, these, okay, so the story is that, um, well, so my aunt's husband, her, his brother, 
um, in addition to 70 of his relatives had been sent to camps or some form of detention or prison. And his brother actually got lethally injected and was killed last November. And it wasn't until this past summer that they found out that he was killed through injection. Um, and so the question that goes to our mind is, and in, this is just one of countless stories, we've also heard from other, um, you know, firsthand witnesses of people who lived in the camps of people being, like, beaten to death. The fact that there is sterilization, there's, um, you know, lethal injections, beatings, organ harvestation that is occurring in these camps and that are clear methods of physical extermination that were actually used during the Holocaust. Um, and so, you know, and... Um, we have like physical physical evidence of the mm. of the existence of these camps just through satellite imagery, for example. Um, and and my you know my, my uncle's story is I one of to countless just examples. Jump in yeah. too, Femi, to say that I think that what we've seen uh, with our research is that this is taking on entirely new um, techniques for repression. Uh, so, you know, Turkel mentions um, using technology and they're actually putting QR codes, you know, the kind of things that we scan to download an app mm. on people's houses so that uh, the Han Chinese government officials can come by and so check they, who's they know in where you house. are. Yeah, we talked about um, that recently. And the other thing that's really um, scary is that actually people are being sent to stay in homes with other Uyghurs. Maybe someone has been left to leave a political education camp. One of the uh, people we spoke to said that once she was able to go home, she found Han officials who wanted to eat and live with her in her house every day so that they could check up on her and see if she really had sort of learned her lessons. And this isn't isolated. In fact, there are hundreds of thousands of Han Chinese who are being mobilized to go into Xinjiang as, and serve as what they call big brothers, living in people's homes to monitor and surveil them in the most mm. intimate way. Uh, so this is a kind of repression that we really haven't seen. Uh, and it goes far beyond these camps uh, where abuses are happening absolutely, but they're also happening every day, just as people try to go about their daily business. Mm. So then it begs the question, Nori, yeah. for, for people online, why aren't there countries doing something about this? I want to share with you just a handful of people. This yeah. is someone watching live on YouTube now who says, why is Pakistan not saying anything to China? You could also broaden this out and ask if Muslim countries are pressuring China. Uh, on Twitter, Nijat says, the silence of Muslim countries are shameful. They partly contributed to this ongoing crime. Another person says, no Muslim nation has criticized China uh, in this review. This silence is deafening. It, it is an excellent question uh, we need to talk about. Um, you know, previously we've been co um, covered the issues uh, in a range of what is happening, but we have to focus more on what should be done about this. Mm -hmm. So the U UPR example is one of the most disappointing. Uh, in fact, it was expected, but you would at least not expect the Muslim countries to come come out and, and be a cheerleader for the communist China oh. that is labeling your religion as a mental disease. At least you would not go up and, 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 and compliment Chinese government. Palestine did that, Syrian representative did that. So the reason why the Chinese government has been so successful silencing these uh, developing countries and Muslim countries is money, economic influence. Mm -hmm. the, uh, and also the, most of the Muslim countries that at question are not Jeffersonian democracy, that the people are not uh, free, free, uh, free to go to the streets to protest on behalf of the Uyghurs. And also, um, some of your audience may not like this, but uh, some Muslim countries believe that China is, is, is the best weapon countering American influence mm -hmm. in the international yeah. communities. Mm -hmm. So because of this, this geopolitical um, um, engagement, and because of this um, uh, ongoing uh, Chinese global influence campaign, Muslim countries have been uh, successfully silenced. Mm -hmm. Gochera, well, I, I, I just want to bring Gochera back into the conversation because you very kindly send us some of your family pictures. And I've been watching you as you've been listening to this conversation. Obviously upset to hear about all of the other families that are going through trauma like you are. Tell us about the pictures that you shared with us. So I, I'm going to start with this one here. Uh, who's this? My mom, okay. Chimangul Zikri. Mm -hmm. She retired from Xinjiang Medical University. She's a uh, more than 40 years experienced pharmacist. So she was taken to a re-education camp, actually jail, uh, last uh, 
February and, and after... What do you know about where we, her whereabouts right now? Uh, she's released after two months okay. from the jail one. Okay. And so then we she's have... isolated at home with sure. my father. Okay. But my other 24 relatives, uh, including oh. my own brother, still in some camps or jail. Okay. Yeah. That, uh, this is my father, mm -hmm. mother and brother. And then one more here. My cousins, uh, father's side. Some of them just got married when they arrested. Some of them have a baby uh, under a year. Some of them successful young businessmen. Some of them just graduate the colleges. So it affected my father's side and mother's side, more than 20 something family. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm sure as you're watching this, you're thinking, what has China got to say? Because the more that we talk about what's happening to the Uyghur communities and populations in China, uh, the more international community is, is asking China about this. Have a listen to this China spokeswoman. She was talking on November the 15th at a Beijing news conference. We welcome well-intentioned attempts to understand the situation. Xinjiang is an open region, but we will firmly oppose ill-intentioned and biased attempts to interfere in affairs of our local governments or rashly criticize China over its internal affairs. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm just wondering, what do you do? What is possible? I mean, to me, two things jump out. One is we need to get independent, credible investigators into Xinjiang. Uh, and we really haven't had that. Uh, we haven't had the UN have the ability to go there and produce a comprehensive report um, from the region itself. Well, we at Human Rights Watch had to do all of our research from outside of the country. And although we heard heartbreaking stories about kids waking up in the middle of the night, missing their parents or families being separated of torture, of deaths, uh, we're doing all of this remotely. So people need access. That's the first thing. And then the second is that um, other countries need to stand up to China and say that this is unacceptable. You can't do something like this in the 21st century to millions of your citizens just with the flimsy excuse that you're fighting terrorism. Um, there are ways that you can fight terrorism and then there are ways to really just be repressing a people for who they are, how they look, or how they pray, and that's what's happening here. Uh, a huge opportunity is that the UN Security Council is actually going to China just over this weekend. Um, and I'm waiting to see if they're going to even mention anything about this or if they'll just go along for, you know, what looks like it could be tourism uh, or something where they just follow the Chinese government's uh, narrative and look at shiny new cities and talk about development and peacekeeping while ignoring these massive rights abuses. Mm -hmm. It's a huge opportunity, but it's also a huge risk. So as we look forward to what to do next, uh, we got this from World Uyghur Con Congress, who says the UN Security Council will visit China this week. It is essential that they raise this issue as a matter of peace and security. Their silence will speak volumes. I didn't, I'll give you the last word there in just about 30 seconds as we wrap up the show. Yes, um, I'd just like to add that um, if governments are staying silent, then at least people can go onto the streets and mobilize and, you know, educate themselves, raise awareness. Because the issue here is like, a lot of people don't know what's happening and a lot of people aren't taking action. And, you know, if people can flood the streets and rally and, and uh, demonstrate for the occupied people of East Turkestan, um, then, you know, I think there will start, the governments will start to, you know, wake up and realize that they should probably do something. But right now we just have signs from both levels, both from the ground and from the top. Like people are staying silent and also government. So, yeah. um, and also just to realize that, you know, this isn't an issue, this isn't an issue about religion or, you know, cracking down, like China's using um, this crackdown on so-called Islamic extremism um, as an excuse to wipe out okay. the people of East Turkestan. All right, so, I hear you. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's amazing to think that we were even having this conversation in 2018. Thank you guests for sharing these personal insights and telling us what you know about the Uyghur population in China. Uh, you can also continue to track developments, of course, on aljazeera.com. Malik and I will see you next time, always on the stream online. Take care.